Warning, this podcast contains discussions of violence and sex. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to the very first episode of Something Wicked, a bonus series from the Three Ravens podcast, all about historical monsters, maniacs and murderers from across the world of folklore. My name's Martin Vaux. I'm a storyteller, writer and English romanticism obsessive, and I'm joined, as ever, by my partner in crime and all dark arts. Eleanor Connor. Hello! <laughs> so, there are so many truly abominable people and events that I'm really interested to talk about on this series, but I thought we should come out of the traps strong. This one is pretty horrendous and reasonably well known, but first question, Eleanor, have you ever heard of Peter Stump? The werewolf of Bedberg. I haven't, and I don't know where Bedberg is. OK, well, let's start with time period. So Peter Stump lived from the early 1530s and was executed, aged roughly 50, in the most extraordinary way on Halloween night, 1589. Well, first, executed on Halloween is a very strong start. But you said in an extraordinary way. What do you mean extraordinary? Oh. Are we talking multi-stage process? <laughs> Were red hot pokers and boiling tar involved? Not far off. Uh, it was definitely a multi-stage process. Oh, no. Come on, then. <laughs> How did they do it? So, he was firstly put onto a Catherine wheel. Now, when we think about Catherine wheels, we normally think of fireworks that spin around, but being broken on the wheel, as it was known, was a fairly common method of execution by torture in the medieval era. It was particularly favoured in Central Europe, where the accused was to firstly be laid down and pinned so their arms and legs were spread out. Then they were beaten with a spoked cartwheel, normally the number of times matching the number of spoked the wheel had, which was typically 12. So 12 crushing slams on each leg, 12 on each arm, which obviously broke them to smithereens. Oh, that's horrible. Yeah. Then the accused was harnessed. This meant braiding them onto the wheel by their broken limbs, with the wheel then mounted upright, a bit like a crucifixion, so the accused would hang by their broken limbs. This is really nasty it and is. I, I don't know how they're still alive at this point i know right it's really nasty and this was to underline it a common method of torture <laughs> for people found guilty of theft as well as murder and after the harnessing bit how is there more <laughs> oh there's more yeah oh, God. so sometimes after the breaking and the harnessing People were then executed by hanging, being dangled from a noose with their weight and the weight of the wheel. Then sometimes they were thrown into a fire, still strapped to the wheel. But either way, they were normally left on the wheel for a long time, dead or alive, often for many days, meaning birds or animals could come and scavenge from their bodies. Oh, wow, that's so rough. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm guessing, though, if that was normal, yeah. that if that was a common thing that happened, poor old Peter Stump didn't just get broken and harnessed on the wheel. Correct. So first he was broken on the wheel, then came the red hot pokers you mentioned actually i was kidding about the red hot pokers <laughs> were there actually red hot pokers involved well they were actually red hot pincers oh, so the executioner used the pincers to tear flesh from his body in 10 places removing most of his skin then there's a van. <laughs> yeah then his arms and legs were lopped off with and this is horrendous the blunt side of an axe oh no then he was beheaded and then his body was tossed into a pyre and burned. So you said body. Yeah. Just out of curiosity, did they burn his head too? Nope. <laughs> of course not. <laughs> so that, his head, was mounted on a pole, which also bore a wheel and a carved wolf with Peter Stump's head on a spike right at the top. So that was meant to stand as a warning to the townsfolk of Bedburg and the surrounding area about similar behaviour. I 
Okay, wow. <laughs> I, I still don't know how he survived the whole thing. <laughs> well, he didn't survive the whole thing. Once his head was off, then yeah, that, no, that, that was, was the that end. Was then, really but, the end um, yeah. Okay, as anyone who listens to our podcast knows, I'm a big fan of wolves. So, how do wolves and werewolves come into this? Well, the stump incident is part of what we now call the European werewolf panic. <laughs> And this rolled through Europe from the early 15th century right through until the early 18th century. That's a long time. It is. And one of the interesting things about this is because wolves had been eliminated in England, there aren't trials of this kind in England from that period. But there was hundreds of cases, over 300 in Germany alone, some of them quite famous, including the werewolf of Chalon in France, the case of Hans the werewolf in Estonia, Thais of Col- Altenbrunn in Latvia and loads of others. So, to reiterate, werewolf trials were quite common. I mean, yes, in short, but this is the period of witch trials in general, and werewolf trials and witch trials had an awful lot in common. Because being a werewolf, or capable of lycanthropy, as it was also known, was seen as a kind of witchcraft. And the two kinds of craze, they like pretty much grew in prominence and faded away more or less in tandem. Whoa. So best estimations are that there were about 100 times more witch trials than there were werewolf trials. And they did cross over quite a bit because wolf riding was classed as a form of lycanthropy in some places. Wolf riding? Yeah, having the power to control wolves and ride them. Oh, I know what I'm going to be reading about later. Goals. <laughs> <laughs> but, OK, talking about Peter Stump specifically. Yeah. Great name, incidentally. Yeah. You've explained how he died, but... What did he actually do to deserve such a horrific death? Well, we know about all of this because the trial was recorded and turned into a pamphlet. And the pamphlet was translated into English and distributed in England in 1590. And to be clear, Peter Stump did horrendous awful things. The pamphlet describes how this man, Peter Stump, who also went by the alias Abel Griswold, (laughs) had been born in the village of Eprath in Cologne, where he became a wealthy farmer. He was a widower with two children, one of whom, Sybil, his daughter of about 15 or 16 years old, was also part of his crimes. And the other, his son, was one of his victims. Oh, so he killed his son. Oh, he killed lots of people over a period of about 25 years. In addition to killing and draining the blood from dozens of goats and lambs and sheep, he killed men, women and at least 14 children, one of whom was his son. And maybe most unsettlingly, he killed two pregnant women and really horribly ate their unborn children, which he described as, and I quote, dainty morsels. Oh no, that is horrendous. Yeah, he was an appalling man through and through. Yet when not in his wolf form, it was said that, and again I'm quoting here, he would go through the streets of Cologne, Bedburg and Eprath in comely habit and very civilly as one well known to all the inhabitants thereabout. And oftentimes was he saluted of those whose friends and children he had butchered, though nothing suspected for the same. So no one suspected him. He was nope. just walking around. Everyone thought he was a pillar of the community. Yeah, that's right. Wealthy farmer. Everyone thought he was an upstanding citizen. And one of the many curious things about him is that he described how he didn't want to commit these crimes. I think you've got to want to. Well, since the age of 12, this is his story, the devil gave him this magic belt and he, by this magic belt, had been forced to transform into an enormous wolf, which was described as strong and mighty, with eyes great and large, which in the night sparkled with fire, a mouth great and wide, with most sharp and cruel teeth, a huge body and mighty paws. Oh, well, we'd better go through our belt collection and see if there are any that turn us into one of those. But so it was described, so people saw the werewolf. Oh, this is one of the most interesting things about the case, because the werewolf which terrorised the area was attacked by a local farmer who was awoken when his livestock were were being attacked. He he rushed outside in the dead of night and then attacked the creature with his sword, chopping off the werewolf's front left paw. Then Peter Stump became the prime suspect because, as you might guess... He was suddenly missing a hand. Yes, that's right. Ah, 
Now, I wasn't going to make this joke yep. because I thought it would be um, a bit off colour. Yeah. But is he called Peter Stump? Because... He has a stump. Exactly. Oh no! <laughs> but so, so his name wasn't Peter Stump, was it? You said, um, a, was it Gris, Griswold? Griswold. Yeah, that's right, Abel Griswold. So maybe. Annoyingly, we don't know for sure because all of the local church registers were lost during the Thirty Years' War of the sixteen hundreds. Okay. So he was caught because of his injury, yes. but I want to know more about the magic belt <laughs> okay. being captured by this idea. All right. Well, it was either a belt or a girdle. Allegedly, Stump was given this belt by the devil when he was 12. And once he put it on, then he transformed into this monster. And this kind of thing is common to a lot of the werewolf trials of the period in that most of the accused said a devilish figure, maybe the devil, maybe another werewolf, either bit them or more frequently, actually, gave them a magical item of clothing, sometimes a wolf skin, sometimes a cloak, which enabled them to transform into a werewolf, after which they had this uncontrollable bloodlust and engaged in acts of sort of mutilation, murder, and I guess cannibalism is what you call it. Wow, that is so fascinating. Yeah. I love the idea of wolf clothing. I know, right? Ah, oh, it's inspiring. <laughs> but it wasn't actually just wolves. There are records of other animals, including... Werebears. Werebears, no Yeah, way. yeah, yeah. And so, was Peter Stump's werewolf belt ever recovered? Alas, no. Oh. So once he was caught and arrested, he was then threatened with torture on a rack, after which he confessed that he'd hidden the belt in a nearby valley. But although the magistrate sent men to go and find it, allegedly... It was never recovered. Oh, so maybe it's still there. Maybe. maybe we could go and find it. Yeah, I mean, maybe the girdle of Peter Stump is out there somewhere still. Also, let's not pretend that someone might have found it, but even not now, admitted. Be transforming into a giant, terrifying yeah, wolf. Yeah, precisely that. And in terms of Peter Stump's other crimes... Other crimes as well. Oh, yeah. Because firstly, as mentioned, he had this daughter, Sybil, known as Beale, with whom he had an incestuous relationship. Oh, no. Did, didn't you say she was only 16? Yeah, 15 oh, or 16. And then he also had another mistress called Catherine, who was his cousin. And that counted as incest back in the day. So there's two extra crimes for you. Oh, Peter. <laughs> and, and you said his daughter was actually involved in the crime. Yes. So apparently, Sybil and Catherine helped lure victims to places like local woodlands, where Peter Stump would then attack and murder them. Though I don't think there's any record of the women engaging in cannibalism or transformations of their own. So they were his accomplices, sort of werewolf associates. Yeah, that's that's right, apparently. Uh, and just to finish, Peter Stump also said that the devil had sent a succubus to him oh. with whom he'd had an intimate relationship on and off across the years. So when you say succubus, what do you mean? Well, succubi are meant to be these creatures of seduction. As most people know, I'm sure they are said to have male counterparts known as incubi or incubus. But succubi specifically are supposed to be descended from four original succubi queens. I mean, this is a whole other thing. That's an interesting thing. Tell me more. <laughs> Who are these succubi queens of which you speak and where can I okay. read them? <laughs> <laughs> well, this is according to the 13th century Kabbalah. These queens are meant to be the demon forms of Lilith the Nightbird, Adam's first wife from the Garden of Eden, her daughters Agrat the Dancer and Neymar, Mother of Plagues. Outstanding names there, yeah. love that, Mother and then of Plagues. The fourth one is meant to be Aisheth the Soul Eater, with the idea being that these women all appear beautiful, but all have deformities that are only revealed after closer inspection, including things like claws or tails. The key thing is that they're looking to find men to seduce them to reproduce and make additional monsters and demons. Is it bad that my brain just went, wow, these poor lonely monster women who just have a little tail and they just they just want to find love. I always seem to see the wrong side of these stories. <laughs> Don't worry, ladies, be empowered. If you have a secret tail, you can find love. <laughs> so um, back, back to Peter Stubb. Yeah. We follow the logic of all this. He was chosen by the devil to father demons yes. by this this poor succubus as sent by the devil yeah precisely that wild <laughs> so yeah and he killed his own son as i mentioned something about which he said he was full of regret and that he really didn't want 
to do, but his wolf form made him. After which he ate his son's brain. <laughs> Yeah. Really didn't want to, though. No, he really didn't want to. No, I mean, apparently he said in his trial or in his confession that it was something that he found sickening to do. And then he, he also had this ongoing relationship with his teenage daughter, his cousin, and the succubus. Wow, busy man. You need a very <laughs> organised diary to arrange all of those affairs, don't you? Well, especially considering he was farming by day. Wow. <laughs> so he was actually quite wealthy. When did he sleep? Quite a successful farmer. And then had this kind of nightlife of, like, horror and terror. I mean, I kind of hope that Peter was able to sleep while the wolf was rampaging and the wolf was able to sleep while Peter was farming and vice versa, but it seems like not as he actually transformed. Indeed, it it seemed like Peter was disgusted by some of the actions he took, or at least that's what he said. So he must have at least been in the mind of the animal, able to see what was happening. Very interesting. Yeah. It's like when you sleepwalk down to the kitchen at night, desperately looking for some toast. (laughs) You're not really conscious of your actions. Luckily, it's just toast and not brains. (laughs) Yeah, that's true. That's very, very true. (laughs) So what happened to the the daughter and the cousin after the trial? I'm assuming the succubus just went back to hell. Yeah, we can presume that she's still fine and and, and (laughs) operating with uh, all of her feminine wiles. Um, But in terms of his daughter and the cousin, they were tried with him. And their punishment was to be flayed. Oh, God. Of all of their skin. Then strangled. uh, Then burned with their remains all buried in the same grave as Peter Stump's ashes. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Now, this whole incident has gone on to be quite famous, but there are a few other caveats worth mentioning. Okay. What, What are they? Well... Peter Stump's crimes just happened to coincide with a period known as the Cologne War, which lasted from 1583 to 88, which was a conflict between Protestant and Catholic factions. Ah. During this conflict, mercenaries were known to have roamed and terrorised the region around Bedburg, committing a range of atrocities. And it might be argued that unsolved crimes from this period could have prompted people to start talking about werewolves prowling the forests. Plus, by 1589, the Catholics had secured control of Bedburg and Stump was a prominent Protestant. So there is a possibility that Stump was kind of singled out because he was so prominent in his Protestantism. It seems like there's quite a lot of evidence for his crimes there. Yeah. And, you know, your hand doesn't just fall off because you're a Protestant. Well, no, that's very true. Most of the evidence, though, came from his own confessions. So I'm not saying he wasn't a monster because, from the sounds of it, he was a murderer and a cannibal and a sexual predator and all sorts of other horrible, nasty things. But there is this other factor at play that might have maybe possibly been an aspect of the whole thing. And that's kind of given a bit of credence by the fact that the newly appointed Archbishop of Cologne and the local Catholic aristocracy were all recorded as attending the execution. Oh, it seems like there's something there then, doesn't yeah. it? Because if, if you think about witch trials and the things people were accused of, which often weren't terribly substantial. Quite right. That saw them convicted after confessions. Yeah. Well, we like to think witches weren't guilty of their crimes, but in this case, I'm somehow inclined to think he really was guilty. I mean, ultimately, we'll never know. But the important thing to remember is that for hundreds of years, men like Peter Stump were executed for crimes not dissimilar to these ones. And for one reason or another, his name lives on even now as one of the earliest high-profile I mean, I'm going to say serial killers that Mm. we know about. I mean, that term obviously came about in the 1970s, serial killer. But uh, I mean, that's kind of how you classify it if this was happening today. Yeah, and the idea that there's this whole werewolf panic, yes. great name for a band, incidentally, werewolf panic, but, um, going on, yeah. seems to imply there was something in it, mm. doesn't there? Yeah. Oh, well, thank you for that. <laughs> I feel suitably disturbed, actually. <laughs> well, in this case, I think my work here is done. <laughs> and what do you have coming up on the next episode of Something Wicked? Oh, well, we're heading to Central Europe, to what is today modern Slovakia, for a wild story of witchcraft, torture and the sadistic murder of hundreds of young women at the hands of Elizabeth Bathory, the bloody Countess of Kaszitska. Oh, a female mass murderer. You don't get those every day or... 
at least you don't get those that have been caught. <laughs> <laughs> In the meanwhile, if you would like bonus content, including all of our episodes ad-free, all of our stories from our mainline episodes as text versions, and bonus content, including special episodes and episodes of the Three Ravens Film Club, please consider joining our Patreon for just $3 a month or $6 a month at patreon.com forward slash three ravens podcast and please if you can write us a review on itunes or apple podcasts email us with thoughts feedback and unicorn artwork if you have it <laughs> to three ravens podcast at gmail.com and follow us on social media via facebook.com forward slash three ravens podcast instagram at three ravens podcast and on twitter via at three ravens pod until next time while our tale of terror has gone that way we'll go this way and remember don't whistle till you're out of the woods Our theme song is the traditional folk ballad Three Ravens, performed by Eleanor Conlon and Ben Harbour, and our artwork is by Ollie James Dare. The Three Ravens podcast is a Rust and Stardust production, written and produced by me, Martin Vaux. Thanks for listening. God sent every gentleman, such hounds, such hawks, and such lean man, with a down derry day.